We are going to skip a song this morning and uh, jump right into things because there is a lot to talk about in these fascinating chapters. Before we start, I just want to welcome uh, all of those who are joining us online. Uh, I have not really done that yet this year, so I want to say a special welcome to the Jersey Shore class. We are so glad that you are actually meeting together and participating in this study alongside of us. I wish we could just beam you up here and have you join us and then send you back home, but uh, I'm glad that you're actually studying for Samuel with us, so welcome. Uh, we will be praying for you guys as time goes on. So let's start and pray uh, before we begin. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you for Jesus, who has been the victor and killed our greatest enemy. Help us to see him in these chapters. Help us to cling to him, to love him more, to commit to him more fully, to serve him more thoroughly. Thank you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. When we left Samuel at the end of chapter 5, he had returned home to Rama, and he grieved over Saul. And we get the sense that this was no mere passing grief. This was not just him having a bad day. 1536 says Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul. And it sounds like a prolonged period of, of sorrow over him. And I think we can understand that, right? He had, after all, poured himself into Saul, he had spent time with him, I'm sure that he loved him, he had a very genuine relationship with him, he was able to say to him, you have acted foolishly, he was able to speak the truth in love. Uh, I think we understand this grief, especially if you've had a child who goes his own way, you can relate to him, this is not just passing sorrow. In fact, in a way, I think we admire Samuel for his grief. It seems to me that the Christian world is lacking a sorrow over sin. There's no shortage of anger over it, but it's, there seems to be a deficit in sorrow, the kind of sorrow that Jesus felt over the sin of Jerusalem. So chapter 15 ends on a low note, and that continues on into 16. But as is always the case, the Lord has his time for everything. For everything, there is a season, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time for every purpose under heaven. The Lord comes to Samuel in the opening verse of chapter 16 and says, How long are you going to grieve over Saul since I have rejected him for being king over Israel? And the next line, I got to say, I just really love. The Lord says to Samuel, Fill your horn and fill your horn with oil and go. Uh, I want to say it to myself when I have overindulged in sorrow uh, or self-pity. I want to say it to my kids when they have perseverated on the negative. Fill your horn with oil and go. It's been long enough now. It's time to move on. Fill your horn with oil and go. I have rejected him. So you get up and go. You know, it may seem a little weird to you, <laughs> but I find this a particularly beautiful moment in this story. Remember that the story of Samuel's life begins with the tears of his mother. And in a way, this has come full circle. Hannah cried over her empty womb, and now Samuel, as an old man, cries over the emptiness of Israel, the void of a godly king over the nation that he loves. And just as the Lord came to Samuel and 
filled her with a son. Now the Lord comes to the fruit of her womb, Samuel, with the good news of his chosen king. That emptiness has been filled. And the Lord says, I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Uh, let's look at the wording there. He says, I have provided for myself. He's basically saying, you see, Samuel, the guy that you have been grieving over, Saul, he was the people's pick. In 1213, in Samuel's farewell address, he says to the people, behold, the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked. In 818, he says something very similar. He says, in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. Saul was the people's choice. This king was to be God's choice, a man after God's own heart, a man of God's own choosing. So go to Jesse, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. You know, part of the word provide has, uh, it, it has a sense of the word seeing in it. It's broken down into two words, of course, from the Latin pro, meaning forward or on behalf of, and vide is to see. So there's an element of seeing involved in that word. God has seen his person, and he is sending Samuel out to find him. And Samuel is scared. If Saul finds out, he's going to kill me. Now, I think this is quite an interesting relationship Samuel has with the Lord. Samuel understands that God sees what he does not see. But even in his unseeing, he is comfortable being honest with the Lord and saying, what am I going to do? If he finds out, he's going to kill me. And of course, the Lord has a solution because whenever he asks you to do anything, he always provides a way. He sees a way. He says, take a heifer with you, make a sacrifice, invite Jesse to it. Now, just in case you are concerned that God is lying here, he's just not revealing his whole purpose. He's not lying. That is not the same thing. And apparently, Samuel was not the only one who was afraid because when the rulers of Bethlehem go out to greet Samuel, they are trembling with fear, thinking, do you come in peace? They're probably wondering, did somebody do something really bad? Is there some big sin here that we don't know anything about? Is there a problem? Is that why you have shown up here in this little town of Bethlehem? And Samuel was like, relax. I come in peace. I'm here to make a sacrifice. I'm really here to see the house of Jesse. And you all remember who Jesse is, right? He is the grandson of Boaz and Ruth, the great-grandson of Rahab. I wonder if they lived nearby. I wonder if they lived in the same house. And Bethlehem, David's hometown, as you well know, is the birthplace of the Messiah, the anointed one. David himself is anointed in the birthplace of the anointed one. Interesting, isn't it? Now the next part of the story reminds me a little bit of a fairy tale. It has this sort of epic fairy tale proportion. When El Eliab arrives, that's Jesse's oldest son, he is apparently rather handsome. We can assume that because of what the Lord says in Samuel, to Samuel in verse 7. He says, do not look upon his appearance or the height of his stature. So he's probably tall and handsome. I'm actually wondering if everyone in this book is tall and handsome. <laughs> this guy's handsome. Saul is handsome. David's handsome. I'm wondering if we're going to get to a paragraph that says... And here enters Shmuel Eliel's fourth son, and he was really not very good looking. <laughs> Super nice, but not so attractive. Samuel is impressed with Eliab's appearance, and he probably goes reaching for that horn filled with oil, thinking, this is my man. And the Lord rebukes Samuel 
for looking at this whole situation in the very same way that the world does, looking on the outside. God sees what we don't see. He sees the heart, the truth about a person's character and their inclination toward him. Now, what does God look for in his people? Is it, is it a cleaned up, well put together bunch of people in an attractive building singing pretty songs? I love what William Blakey says about what the Lord is looking for in his people. And I couldn't possibly say it better myself, so I'm gonna read to you what he says, quote, the lowly sense of personal unworthiness, the wondering contemplation of divine love, the eager longing for mercy to pardon and grace to help, faith that grasps the promises, the hope that is anchored within the veil, the kindness that breathes out benediction all around, the love that beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. It is these things, breathing forth from the heart of a congregation that gives pleasure to God, end quote. God had to redirect Samuel's gaze from the outside to the in. So back to the fairy tale. Jesse parades each one of his sons before Samuel, and it's no, not that one, no, not that one, and it's starting to feel a little bit like Cinderella searching for the foot that fits the glass slipper. Now when I say it feels like a fairy tale, I do not for one second think that it was not real. This was real, this happened. But fairy tales have a lot of transcendent truth. That's why I love them. They copy the reality of the most beautiful tale of all, the greatest story that was ever told in the world, the best story of all, all stories, which also just happens to be true. I mean, think about what happens in most fairy tales, isn't it usually a town that has been put under some kind of spell by an evil force and they're all a little bit half asleep, they don't really know what's going on. And then the noble, wonderful prince comes from another place and he finds his bride and he touches her and she is restored and everyone lives happily ever after. Sounds like another story, doesn't it? So this buildup is huge. Uh, they're all waiting and Samuel finally says, hey, are all your sons here? Is there anybody else here? Could there possibly be a beautiful scullery maid locked in a tower somewhere you think I wouldn't be interested in? And Jesse responds, well, there's the youngest, but he's out with the sheep. You know, the little runt of the litter, you're probably not too interested in him. I'm telling you, it's not easy being the youngest. I know because I am one. Uh, there is not an overflowing amount of respect coming from young older, older siblings toward their youngest. I mean, I could tell you stories and you know what, I'm gonna. <laughs> it's in my head, so it has to come out my mouth. That's the rule. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, you know, in, in my, I was very friendly, I was a friendly child, and that is a crime worth punishing uh, if you have over older siblings. And whenever we would go in, in the car on a trip, uh, I would always like to say hello to the toll collector. And if you are not old enough to know what a toll collector is, <laughs> there was a guy in a booth and he took your money and he held up all the traffic. <laughs> So I thought, we're a boring job, you know, it might be nice to say hi to the guy, see how he's doing. So I would stick my head out the window and say hi, and my siblings would find that absolutely mortifying. Uh, so if they saw they were better readers than me, so if they saw that there was a sign saying a toll coming, they would get me, pin me down on the floor, the back seat of the floor, sit on me until we were safely past the toll and then they would let me go. And apparently, uh, I am kind of wondering where my parents were. Uh, 
They were in the front seat, probably having some deep theological conversation, completely unaware of what was going on, an inch and a half behind their heads. But I'm telling you, younger children, they don't really need to be anything that they're doing wrong. They just, your sheer existence seems to really bother them. So it's not so easy being the youngest. Now Samuel hears that there's a younger child and he is such a tough guy, he's like, go get him. And in this moment, he really reminds me of my father-in-law who is this very big, tough guy. And I can picture Big Bob Peretti saying, uh, no one's sitting down until he gets here. No one sits. I love this guy. I think it's so cool that he says that. Uh, the suspense is pretty thick and it just adds to the buildup. And sometimes, honestly, I wish I did not know how it ended because I would be hanging on the edge of my seat going, who is the lucky winner? They're all standing there staring at each other. No one dares to sit down. I wonder how long it takes to go get a shepherd and bring him out from his field. And then finally, in walks David, and he is ruddy and handsome, and he has beautiful eyes. Interesting detail. <laughs> and the Lord says, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And can you imagine what they were thinking? They're probably like, You have got to be kidding me. This kid? What is so great about him? And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward and never left him. And Samuel went home. It's interesting that Samuel anointed David many years before he would take office. A high calling needs a lot of preparation, yes. David probably went back to his sheep. He watched over his flock. He fed them. He protected them. He healed the sick ones. He bound up all the broken bones with a splint. He righted the ones who had fallen over and could not right themselves. And he brought back the ones who wandered. It's all pretty good experience, right? Pretty good preparation for the shepherd king of Israel. And so much like the one, the anointed one that would follow David about a thousand years later, also born in Bethlehem. All those things Jesus has done for us. All those things Jesus has done for me. He has watched over me. He has fed me, protected me, healed me, bound up my broken bones, righted me when I fell, when I could not right myself, and brought me back when I wandered away. The end of 16 tells us that a harmful spirit came over Saul and his servants, probably tired of dealing with all of that and its associated behavior and bad moods, uh, wanted desperately to find a solution to this problem. So it's a band-aid, of course. What Saul really needed was repentance, but music therapy provided some temporary relief and once again, another servant to the rescue. A young man had heard of the son of Jesse, skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence, pretty good resume. And most importantly, the Lord was with him. And that's what made David different. Isn't it interesting how the Lord made things happen in this book? I mean, a couple of lost donkeys and Saul meets the prophet. Saul needed music therapy and in walks David, the newly anointed king into the house of the lame duck king. And then in chapter 17, Jesse sent David with some lunch for his brothers on the battlefield. And if you are at all familiar with the comedian Brian Regan, you will understand this joke. And if you don't, I'm so sorry. Talk to someone, find out what it means. But David goes in with lunch 
and one thing leads to another, and he cuts off the head of his opponent. <laughs> God uses ordinary means to accomplish his purposes. We're often looking for the extraordinary, but God is not limited by the ordinary. He is sovereign over the ordinary circumstances, the ordinary people in our ordinary lives. Now what comes next is probably the most famous story in the whole Bible. People who know nothing of the Bible usually know this story. And sometimes I wish we were more unfamiliar with it because I think often it's when we think we know something so well that we really don't know it at all. The Philistines uh, and the Israelites are faced off against each other in military format and out from the Philistines emerges a giant, Goliath. He is nine feet, six inches tall. Now the Guinness World Book of Records has listed a man from Illinois in 1940 as the tallest man in the world at 8'11". So Goliath is just a little bit more, a little taller than the man from Illinois. He is a very large dude, and not only is he big, but he's also wearing 125 pounds of armor. And he has a shield bearer, which seems like an unfair advantage, uh, that goes out ahead of him carrying a shield that is probably the size of a, you know, a massive door. Can you imagine being that, having that job? Uh, at, at, sitting down at a dinner party and someone saying, what do you do? And I'm like, I carry a shield for a giant. You know, that's what I do. Fun job. So this little exercise, lining up in military format and staring at each other had been going on for 40 days. And on this particular day, David's father had sent him with some food for his brothers at the encampment. In those days, if you were at war, you had to come up with your own food. The army did not supply it, so generally, your family would provide it for you. David goes out with lunch, not knowing, of course, that this is going to be the most significant day of his life. Interesting, isn't it, that you could step out of your house tomorrow morning and not know that it might be the most important day of your life. He arrives just in time to hear Goliath talk and smack to the Israelites. And in a way, you have to admit that he asks a decent question in verse eight. He says, why have you come here to draw up for battle? Aren't I a Philistine? Aren't you Saul's army? Why aren't you doing anything, basically, is what he's asking. Why aren't you fighting? Aren't you the army of Israel? Don't you have that God that's supposed to do all these miracles? Why are you just standing there? Why isn't anyone doing anything? Not a terrible question. Choose a man, let him fight me. If he kills me, we'll be your servants. If I kill him, you're our servants. Goliath continues to taunt the armies of Israel, and they're terrified, so nothing happens. Now, I don't know if you remember, but last week I mentioned that the author of Samuel was particularly good at getting to the heart of a matter by comparing and contrasting two characters. Last week we compared Saul to Jonathan, and this week we see that same skillful comparison between the lives of Saul and David. Now this is the first battle that Saul faces after being rejected by the Lord and the Lord's removal of his spirit. And this is an interesting moment for Saul. Saul had received God's spirit at the time of his anointing. But that does not necessarily mean that his heart had been made new, uh, that he was right with the Lord, that he had experienced regeneration of his spirit in the way that we think of it. It meant that God's spirit was providing and equipping him for the role that the Lord had assigned him. But at this point in the story, because of his repeated disobedience, Saul no longer has God's spirit. So for the very first time, Saul faces his problems on his own. He has to do his job in his own strength. And we see how well that's going. 
You know, we should be on our knees 24 hours a day praising God and thanking him for his abiding spirit. Praising God that we do not have to fight our battles on our own, that we do not need to live all on our own, not without the abiding presence of God. It is by and through his spirit that we can ever know Christ, our anointed king, our giant slayer, who has once and for all killed the giant of sin and death our greatest enemy. There is such an irony here in this story because you see, Saul's most impressive feature was his height. Saul was Israel's own Goliath in a sense. And now this tall man trembles before a taller competitor. And here he learns the lesson of relying on the strength that the world has to offer. There is always someone taller and smarter and richer and more beautiful and has better clothes and more friends. Always, 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 always. Saul is stuck relying on himself. David, on the other hand, relies on the Lord. Now this might have been the first time in David's life that he ever heard anyone curse the God of Israel and his people and he is outraged. He is filled with righteous anger. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Isn't that the best insult in the entire world, you uncircumcised Philistine? I am dying to call someone that. <laughs> but I know it's not going to end well. It's also the only sensible, only biblical, only faith-filled thing that anyone has said since this scene has opened. Now it's interesting because from verses 28 to 49, David experiences varying degrees of opposition from three different places. You might call it three different temptations. Starting with his brother Eliab in verse 28, Eliab was very angry with Saul and he says, why have you come down here? And then he gives a well-placed jab and says, and with whom have you left those few sheep of yours? That's a, quite a put down, as if to say, you call yourself a shepherd, you take care of a couple of little baby puny sheep, you are nothing and you're doing nothing. And he says, I know the presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down here to see the battle. I mean, can you imagine? David just basically brought him a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> he is there for no other reason than the sovereign God of the universe has brought him there. There is no bad intent in him. And I have to say, I am so impressed by the restraint that David exercises in response. Because if that had been me, <laughs> I would have said, battle? What battle? Could you please direct me to the battle? Because I don't see any battle going on around here. I see a bunch of guys standing around staring at each other, shaking in their sandals and contemplating their navels, but I certainly don't see any battle. So if you could please direct me, I'd appreciate it. David, of course, did not say that. He didn't defend himself. He didn't justify himself. He didn't retaliate. Doesn't it sound a little bit like someone else? It's pretty hard when the jabs come from within your own family or from within your own church, from within your own people. That's especially painful. That was the first temptation. He could have easily given in to that, gotten all flustered and upset. And can you believe that guy? And never done what the Lord brought him there to do. Then the opposition from Saul. And here's where we learn a lot about what's going on inside their hearts. But Saul basically says, look kid, uh, I appreciate your willingness to fight, that's really commendable, but you're a child, so you cannot go up against this giant. Saul was doing the very same thing that he'd been doing all along, looking on the outside, not looking on the inside. He sees nothing of the spiritual and he tries to put Saul in his own armor. 
David's response is so telling. He doesn't start boasting about his own abilities. He describes what he's done in the past. Bears and lions used to come after my sheep. I went after them and attacked them and rescued my sheep out of their mouths and killed the beast. That's quite a thing. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And here's the most important point. The Lord who delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. He's looking at what the Lord has saved him from in the past and believing that he will do it again in the future. He has saved me from a bear. He can save me from a giant. It reminds me of Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If he saved me from a lion, he can save me from a giant. He is not bragging about his own skill. He is trusting in the God who was with him, the living God. Saul and his company were behaving as though God were dead. But David believes and trusts in the living God. Saul no doubt believed God was alive, but he was behaving as though God were dead. We need to be careful that we actually believe what we profess to believe. There is a little comic relief here in 38 to 40 as Saul dresses up David in his armor. Saul keeps trusting in the tools of this world. Uh, but J David rejects the symbols of strength and power that Saul offered him, and it was probably quite the temptation. Can you imagine having been able to say, hey, I wore the king's armor? That's pretty cool. David won this battle because he came in his weakness. He had faith in the living God, so he did not need to use the weapons of this world. This is not a story on how to outsmart your enemies by finding your own style. The Lord wants all of his people to rely not on the latest in weapons or tactics of the world, but on the greatness of their Savior. Then there was, of course, the final encounter with Goliath. The giant hated David and cursed him. He was insulted by him. But this is what David says in response to Goliath. I want to read it to you, verses 45 to 47. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a, with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head and I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly, so these are God's people, that all this assembly will know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Goliath had not heard anything like that before. And you kind of wonder if the words from this young voice gave him pause to stop and think. You see, this was not about David at all. This was all about the Lord, so that all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel, that he saves not with sword and spear, and that the battle is his. Like David, the weapons that the Lord has given the church are more powerful than anything that the world has, but we need to wield them, not just to make our life better, not just to make our country better, but to glorify the Lord himself so that all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel, that there is a God in New Jersey even. We need to stand firm against the evil and the sin of this world because it is an affront to the living God of the universe. There is so much written about how we can be just like David. We can use those skills unique to us and win the battle. Use your five little stones and conquer the giant. The whole point here is that we cannot be like David. 
but there is another conqueror whom David foreshadowed. David is not just an example for us to follow, but he is a picture of the saving work of Jesus Christ to cling to. This book, from beginning to end, is all about Jesus. He is the hero of the story, we are not. David had been anointed, but the world did not know that. The world did not recognize him as king. Nobody knew that. He was going completely under the radar. He was just some little kid who stepped away from his sheep. Jesus, Messiah, that literally means anointed one. He was, is the king of the universe, but the world did not recognize him as such either. When he, in his weakness, was victorious over the ugly giant of sin and death on the cross, he too was going under the radar by most of the world, not known as the king of the universe. David approached his enemy in his weakness, and I imagine that nothing looked weaker than Jesus dying on a cross. But in his weakness, he was victorious over sin and death. David used Goliath's own weapon against him, the weapon that Goliath was certain he would use to kill this scry little kid. David used it to sever the head of the giant from his body. And Jesus, praise God, did the same thing. He turned Satan's weapons against Satan. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, through death, he destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. He put our enemy to open shame and triumphed over him. Praise God. We don't have to. Father, we praise you and we thank you for your book. We praise you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the one who has already done the worst thing that we could ever encounter, that he has killed the enemy of sin and death. Help us now to live like he did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.